Continuing in the same vein, uh, Merv Richard from the National Gallery in Washington will speak to the, uh, about further studies on the benefits and disadvantages of adding silica gel to microclimate packages for panel paintings. Merv. And with that title, that's a mouthful. Uh, thank you. Um, for 27 years now, I've been involved in some aspects of the development and testing of microclimate packages for paintings. Uh, one might conclude that either I'm a little bit slow or I haven't spent enough concentrated time on it. Um, but I think I'm sort of getting near the end of the work that um, I'm planning to do anyway. Um, as Lauren has sort of pointed out, microclimate uh, packages have been used for many years to stabilize the environment of paintings traveling in temporary exhibitions or in installations where the relative humidity is not well maintained. Many terms have been used to describe them, climate boxes, microclimate case, microclimate vitrine, microclimate packages, the latter term being the one that we're using most commonly now at the National Gallery. By the way, this is the, one of the very first microclimate packages that I worked on, which was for the Philadelphia Art Museum and their Dutch Genre exhibition back in 1983, I think. Um, while their uh, microclimate packages are widely used, there's been considerable debate about whether silica gel should be included with the painting. I will address this question in the second half of my talk. Glasses help. Um, I find it useful to actually begin my talk with my conclusions so that you can think about what I plan to say later on while I give the, the discussion. Um, first of all, my conclusions are that microclimate packages are definitely beneficial for panel paintings being loaned to institutions for long, uh, less than ideal environments. I have not focused on the question of microclimate packages that are being used year after year after year um, in environments uh, without... Um, in museums or, or private homes without uh, micro, uh, good RH control. Um, secondly, silica gel is not required for a well-made microclimate package that contains a relatively small volume of air and is exhibited in a moderate environment. If the microclimate package has significant leakage, however, properly conditioned silica gel will improve the performance. Without the silica gel in the painting, um, there is, without silica gel in the package, there's only the painting to buffer the environment should there be leakage. Silica gel will not adversely affect um, the panel painting, which is uh, one thing I feel very confident about now. Um, for during transit, temperature-induced dimensional changes that typically occur will cause quite, quite small dimensional changes as compared to what normally happens in the relative humidity fluctuations of which we are concerned. In recent years, we've made our microclimate packages with metal laminate foils. The two commonly used materials at the National Gallery are Marvel Seal 360 and Mitsubishi um, sealing foil. In making these packages, narrow strips are usually made from the much larger roll. We use both an acrylic glazing as well as laminated glass. Um, quite frankly, which one we happen to use in a particular situation is often based on the individual involved, um, what the um, frame rabbit happens to be like in that particular frame, and in some cases, budget may come into play as well. Um, the advantages of, of the acrylic glazing is that it's much lighter in weight, um, and uh, the disadvantage is it's much more flexible, so as the size of the microclimate package uh, increases, that can be a problem. Um, the newer versions of the, um, the acrylic glazings that are available, uh, the anti-static um, material that's being used today works quite well. So in fact, uh, we found that materials like Optium, which is one of the products available in America anyway, um, that the static electricity with this material is less than what you would find with glass. Um, We've tried many adhesives over the years in making these packages. At first, we relied almost exclusively on 3M hot melt uh, glue adhesives. 
Uh, we found particularly that number 3748 and number 3797 are the ones that work best. Uh, the, the 3748 seems to have slightly better adhesion to the glass and the acrylic glazing materials. Um, these are hot melt glue adhesives that have been selected because they've been approved for use with electronic components, which means that they're um, uh, sort of off-gassing or other potential corrosive problems um, are not something for concern. Um, in more me recent years, we've relied more heavily on uh, tape for adhesion, and uh, the product of choice today, anyway, is um, a 3M product, which is their Scotch adhesive transfer tape. There's no carrier here. It's pure adhesive. Um, it's number 908. It's acid-free, and it's very sticky. Um, now, I'd like to describe briefly a few of the techniques that we use before I get to the more technical part. Um, in this slide, you see a painting by Titian of Ranuccio Fanese, uh, which was actually in Lawrence's presentation a moment ago. This is a painting on canvas, not a panel painting. But in essence, um, the uh, laminated foil material is adhered to the glass. In slides that will follow, uh, I'll show the process for making that. We actually use a double layer of the foil material, um, as I will discuss in a moment. But in essence, uh, you have uh, the glazing material. You have some spacer to keep the painting away from it. Um, you may or may not have silica gel um, in the package, and then the sides and reverse um, are most typically going to be marble seal, although on occasion we may have something else uh, on, as a back layer as opposed to marble seal. Uh, it just depends. Um, we do many of these microclimate packages every year. I don't know the exact number, but probably it's 15 to 20 a year for various reasons. And um, with this package, it's totally independent from the frame. And um, uh, you can sort of see the glazing material here on the front with the marble seal adhered to the sides. Um, this is another painting, uh, which is on canvas, not on panel, but another Titian. And in this example, you see that Hugh Phibbs has already attached um, a layer of marble seal to the front edge of the glazing material and the side. Uh, in this particular example, I think Hugh probably used uh, the hot melt glue adhesive. Um, and he also attached a second layer of marble seal on the edge of the um, inside part of the glass. And then once that's done, the two layers are heat sealed together. Um, this is a good opportunity for me to mention um, a few people that have been heavily involved in the development of these at the National Gallery. Um, I'm involved in some of the technical aspects, but other people get credit for working out the, the various you know, idiosyncratic aspects of the way we do this work. Uh, Hugh Phibbs is the star of the team. Um, Hugh has never felt that there was a good enough mouse trap out there, and he continues to look for new ways of remaking everything. Um, but also Steve Wilcox, our frame conservator, has been very involved. In the last couple of years, Beth Ann Heinball, who's a conservator that works on exhibitions, um, she's actually taken on the burden of organizing the uh, making of these uh, microclimate packages. Um, here's the actual ironing, ironing process of sealing the uh, two layers together, and you can see how it's attached to the glass here. Um, how much surface area you can cover on the front depends on the rabbit that you're working with. Um, it then has been fit into uh, the frame, which may or may not, it may or may not be adhered in place with uh, double stick tape. Um, it may simply lay in there, or we may attach it to the back of the frame. It just depends. Uh, this is an example of one that has um, a silica gel panel. We've done many different varieties of silica gel panels, and we use art absorb sheets. This one uh, being made with a double layer of mat board, which Hughes come up with an ingenious way to sandwich silica gel in between the mat board. And then there's also a small data logger here uh, for monitoring the conditions during uh, the time that it's on exhibition. And then this is the layer of marble seal, which is completely heat sealed around the perimeter. Um, and uh, so therefore, you get a very good seal. Uh, one of our Raphaels, um, since uh, you've seen these slides a moment ago, uh, I'll go very quickly. But 
Um, in this case, you know, you can see the spacer that's being used. Oops, sorry. Um, well, we'll go on. Um, cleaning the glass is a huge problem. If you want to know more about it, um, you can email me, and I'll get you in touch with Hugh Fibbs, who has gone crazy trying to figure out the best ways to do this. Um, the materials that they put on to protect the glass um, end up being very difficult in some cases to get off adequately. And uh, this is test fitting the Raphael panel um, into the frame. Um, it will then end up with a, um, a layer of silica gel yes, or maybe a layer of silica gel no, depending on uh, what we've decided in that particular um, case. And um, here the um, uh, painting is covered with the marble seal across the back that's heat sealed in place, and mending plates are holding the, the painting in position. Um, and then there's a backing board on the back. Um, now, with the packages that I've just described, I've done a fair amount of testing for leakage using uh, a carbon dioxide monitor. And these packages that I've just described of work extremely well with air exchange rates of typically in the 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 air exchanges per day, which is very good compared to museum cases. Um, the last year and a half with Beth Ann has been experimenting with techniques which are more similar to the frame that, uh, the, the package that Laurent described and used it recently on a Twachman. Uh, this is the number 908 tape that's being adhered to the back of the marble seal. You notice that the strip has been made to begin with. Um, Beth Ann has found that putting the tape on the marble seal and then putting that, attaching that to the frame rabbit works much better than putting the tape on the frame rabbit and then trying to uh, attach the marble seal on top of that. Um, <clears throat> It's put in position in ways that you've seen um, in some of the examples Laurent just showed. This is actually a marble sealed tape, and this is an extra piece put in the corner in order to fill out the corner of the system. There is a layer of Valara, which has been, which is a polyethylene foam, which will uh, then allow the glass to sit on this Valara and form a seal. Uh, tape is also placed on top of the layer of Valara. The glass is dropped into position. As you see here, we will use a spacer, sometimes Valara, sometimes uh, balsa wood, to keep the painting away from the glass. The blue color of the glass is because of the um, protective layer of uh, plastic that's still on the glass. And then here you see the painting in its frame, um, and ultimately the back will be um, covered with marble seal and heat sealed. Um, I'm done with my examples, but now in terms of uh, a few, a couple of the many um, times that I've actually monitored these in transit as well as on exhibition, uh, this is a painting by Lorenzo Lato. And um, this lavender colored line is the temperature both inside and outside the vitrine during uh, a rather lengthy exhibition at two venues. These are the environmental conditions in the galleries of the two museums that we lent to. Somewhere right in here is where the transfer was made. This is the relative humidity within the microclimate package throughout this period of time. A second example is a painting by Robert Henry. Um, the Lato was on panel. This one's on canvas. This painting was lent to an embassy in Europe for over two years. The National Gallery, being a national institution, we do feel an obligation to provide uh, you know, some works of art to embassies in foreign countries. Um, the logger ran out of memory, so it writes over itself, so I don't have the full period that it was on exhibition. But um, these are the conditions inside the microclimate package over a period of time. This particular package did not contain silica gel. Uh, these are the temperature conditions at the embassy. You see they work pretty hard to keep it fairly stable, but these are the relative humidity conditions inside. Um, this is, has a uh, data logger that's on the back of the frame. Um, and we do this in a way to try to minimize the effect of the wall. Um, we actually hollow out the, the, the um, addition to the back of the frame um, to make a space so it reads um, not directly against the wall. 
Now we're getting to the juicy part of my talk, which is the technical aspect. Um, this is not my child. I don't know whose child this is. This came out of Google. <laughs> but before I start showing graphs, I want a little levity here. Um, anyway, uh, strain gauges. Um, I've been working with strain gauges since 1976. Um, I find that they work very well for the kind of work that I'm doing. Um, in essence, uh, you have a coil of material, either wire in the old ones or later foil, and by monitoring changes in the electrical resistance, I can measure incredibly small dimensional changes. If I breathe on a thin piece of wood with a strain gauge, I can see it move. Um, with my research, I have various panels which have uh, been, that are real works of art that have been designated as research material at this point. Um, and then I also have made um, for me uh, panels using older wood, and I typically put you know, at least three strain gauges on the back. I have panels with six or seven strain gauges on the back that I've used in the work. Um, now, one thing to sort of focus on in the very beginning is the fact that wood responds dimensionally to changes in temperature, as well as changes in humidity. They are relatively insignificant compared to relative humidity under normal circumstances. But in microclimate packages, it becomes a slightly different situation. One thing to take note and register, this is the radial um, thermal coefficient of expansion for white oak. Um, here you see the tangential thermal expansion. It's not that different than white lead or Naples yellow, but take note of the fact that materials like copper and aluminum that we all think of as expanding and contracting with temperature, well, in fact, their thermal expansion coefficients are significantly lower than, than white oak, for example. Um, you're going to see a few graphs like this. I could show you 150 graphs like this, but uh, this is an example of a white oak, of white oak panels in a microclimate package with no added um, silica gel when exposed um, in an environmental research chamber from temperatures of 20 degrees centigrade to zero degrees centigrade and then back up. Here's copper, here's aluminum. These are the readings from the strain gauges on two of my test panels. This one, this area responded much more as you note. Um, this dark blue line is actually the theoretical expansion of white oak in the radial direction, which means that you know, the numbers are behaving the way that one would hope that they would behave. One thing that I need to emphasize is you really have to think differently about relative humidity and temperature effects on panel paintings and microclimate packages um, than in an open gallery. In an open gallery space, the moisture content of the air is affecting the paintings, and that is the driving force. In a microclimate package, there's relatively little air, and it is the painting or other hygroscopic materials inside that is affecting what's going on inside the package. Uh, I don't need to dwell on this. Everyone in this room is well aware of the fact that the materials we're working with are all hygroscopic and that they contain different quantities of moisture at a given relative humidity. But it is significant in terms of what I'm about to go into to, to note that silica gel contains much more moisture um, at any given relative humidity level than does uh, wood or paper, for example. Uh, there's also a phenomenon that I'm not going to dwell on now called hysteresis, which means that you get a different curve when you're plotting this if you are adsorbing moisture as compared to desorbing moisture. And if you move from 30% humidity to 70% humidity, you, don't, you sort of operate in this little loop. I don't have time to go into details about that. Um, most of my work in the laboratory is done with this environmental chamber, which can go from minus 40 degrees centigrade to plus 200 centigrade. I can control temp or relative humidity as well from a little bit above zero centigrade up to about 95. Um, Back to this, I spent a year and a half trying to quantify the equilibrium moisture content of silica gel as a function of temperature and humidity. Um, got good semi-qualitative information, but not good quantitative information. And then I was able to purchase this instrument, which is a high-performance vapor um, analysis um, instrument by um, TA Instruments Incorporated, uh, and it has been working extremely well. Um, and uh, samples are placed on a, t a small sample is placed um, 
on this little sample holder, the cup here, I can load 10 samples um, at a time. Uh, basically, you have a thermally controlled, very, very sensitive balance, two humidity chambers. This is a reference sample. This is the actual sample. Um, and then the humidity is controlled with an electronic, um, uh, basically a very precise valve that's been adjusted, and you are using a source of uh, uh, high-purity nitrogen to um, actually feed into the chamber, not air, in order to precisely control the humidity. Um, so these are uh, the curves at 10 degrees centigrade for four different types of silica gel. And um, you get very different curves depending on which gel you're working with. Uh, these measurements have been made at 5% relative humidity increments. Um, my objective is to finish uh, a fairly extensive study of these particular silica gels and then to sort of publish a paper later on, which is just on the physical properties of the silica gels we use. Uh, these are the same uh, materials, but now at 25 degrees centigrade, um, there are shifts in the uh, properties of these materials with temperature and humidity. Um, <clears throat> But the most important point that I want to make now with regard to microclimate packages is that some of you have been told, and I'm asked about this all the time, that you should not use silica gel in these packages because the equilibrium moisture content of hygroscopic materials is affected by whereas the temperature changes um, have, or the temperature changes have a negligible effect on silica gel. Um, these conclusions come directly from a single paper published by Nathan Stolo, or a little booklet, in 1966, where Nathan um, showed a diagram like this. This is the equilibrium moisture content of various materials with changes in temperature while humidity remains constant. And what Nathan said was that you would see a fairly significant change in, in wood, in paper, and cotton, but he said that the effects of temperature on silica gel are negligible. And from this, various authors went on to point out why you shouldn't add silica gel to packages because um, uh, it would have an adverse effect since temperature was responding differently, um, or uh, silica gel was responding differently than wood. And to explain the conclusions that were being drawn, if I have a microclimate package, I have a panel painting inside. It's going to be exchanging moisture with that tiny little bit of air inside um, in order to come to equilibrium at a new temperature. And that tiny amount of moisture involved is very tiny compared to what would happen in an open gallery space because there's so little air. Whereas if you add silica gel to the package, not only are you exchanging uh, moisture with the air, but you're also exchanging moisture with the silica gel. And if this is being affected differently by temperature than this, it means that the silica gel with a large reservoir of moisture could be feeding the panel or drying out the panel in an unpredictable way. But for that to happen, the assumption has to be that, in fact, the effects of temperature on silica gel are negligible. So um, I decided I really wanted to know the answer to that. And using the instrument that you saw, uh, the TA instruments, um, in fact, oops, sorry. In fact, this, the isohume, this means these are the plots of um, the effect of temperature changes on the equilibrium moisture content of various materials. Here is matte board. Here is wood. In this case, it's Quercus alba, which is white oak. This is rapid gel, which is a product that Steve Weintraub is um, selling. Um, here we have Artsorb, here we have regular density silica gel, here we have um, Prozorb. None of these changes are negligible. In fact, they are slightly greater than wood, the reverse of what Nathan Stolo said. This is the isohume um, at 40%, and then these are the isohumes at 60%. Um, the significant increase here is because silica gel contains more moisture. But the slope of these curves, with the exception of the rapid gel, are not dramatically different than wood. Um, so I've run many tests, again, in the, envir environmental, uh, in the environmental chamber, where I'm monitoring the temperature and the relative humidity as well as the dimensional activity of the panels inside. Um, in this case, we have an insulated packing case. 
this is the large um, panel and medium panel. The medium one contains rapid gel. Um, the weight of rapid gel used at 50% humidity was equal to 50% of the weight of the panel. The same was true for the regular density silica gel. Uh, as the temperature initially drops, in this case from 20 all the way down to minus 20 degrees centigrade, there is a slight um, blip in relative humidity because the moisture absorbing properties um, of the buffering materials inside have a slight lag time. You will then see that the relative humidity in the package will reach a new equilibrium because of uh, the effect of temperature on the equilibrium um, the desired equilibrium state of both the wood and the silica gel. And then when I heat the package back up, the reverse happens. Now, what's happening dimensionally with my panel? Um, in this case, here is the theoretical dimensional activity given this temperature change of copper. Um, here is the medium silica gel panel inside, which has the rapid gel. Here is the um, large panel inside white oak again that contains regular density silica gel. And we see a dimensional change that is totally driven by temperature um, with no sort of impact really of the silica gel being in the package as compared to not having silica gel. And I have many, many, many experimental runs and I could bore you with graphs all, e all day, but um, uh, that brings me now to my conclusions which you've already seen. Microclimate packages are beneficial. The only thing I don't want to address is I don't have experience with the issue of long-term placement of, micro, of panel paintings in microclimate packages for year after year after year, because we take hours back out. Um, silica gel is really not required. You're going to get essentially the same behavior in a microclimate package, whether you add silica gel or don't add silica gel, as it relates to temperature changes that are occurring in the system. However, if you have a well-made package, that's true. If you have moderate ambient conditions where you're sending the painting, that's true. If you have a leaking package or if you have really extreme ambient conditions plus a leaking package, then in my opinion, place silica gel inside uh, in whatever way works best for you because it will improve the performance over the long run in order to compensate for leakage. Uh, and then finally, my conclusion that um, I feel very strongly that having silica gel in there will not affect the behavior of the panel painting at all. Thanks for listening. Thank you.